Well, it's great to be here, everybody, and uh, to spend some time with you. I am blind, as you can tell, from my cane, so I'm actually going to take that down so I don't have to hold it, if that's all right. Um, thank you, Tom, for your kind words. I will tell you that uh, when Tom says all those words, really, it's a mutual relationship. He says that I mentored him. He actually has mentored me on many, many things. Any major decision I've made in my life since I've known Tom, I call Tom. Usually go to lunch, ask him what he thinks, get his perspective. Uh, and he says that Cindy and I taught him. He and Sandy taught us about date night, which is critical as a couple. Date night. Okay. So I'm going to do a couple things here today. My wife Cindy and I are both going to be speaking to you. And uh, the first thing I'm going to do is tell you a little bit about my life story. And then we're going to introduce you a framework to consider for your life, to look at your life, a framework for you to consider. And then Cindy's going to actually take a couple of those and go deep into a couple of those elements of that framework. So when I was eight years old, I was in my dad's room, and he asked me to hand him the TV remote. And it was dark in his room, and I said, well, Dad, where's the remote? And he said, oh, it's on the bed. And so I went over to find the remote. And I started to pat around the bed. It was dark in there, and I couldn't see. And the remote, let's say, was right here. And I kept patting around to try to find it. And my dad was looking at me, and he said, what's he doing? He, he, he thought I was teasing him. He said, Paul, come on, come on, come on. Give me the remote. And so now I got nervous because I could tell he was getting frust flustered. And I started to go faster and faster. I kept missing that remote. And then my dad realized, you know, I don't think he sees it. And he came over, grabbed the remote, and used it. Two or three days later, we were walking to go out for ice cream, and it was dusk. It was getting dark. And as we were walking out, I didn't realize the car door was open, and my dad was walking right behind me, and he observed me literally walk right into the door, and I fell back to the ground. I was only eight years old. I was a small kid. And then he said, clearly something wrong with my son. And they took me down to the University of Minnesota, which had the, the retinal specialist area of the region in the Midwest at that time. And I was diagnosed with this very difficult disease called retinitis pigmentosa, which is a disease that has two main characteristics. One, night blindness. That's why at a young age I couldn't see in the dark. And number two, tunnel vision. So you've ever heard people joke about tunnel vision. Oh, they've got tunnel vision. In other words, they can't see beyond themselves. That's a real condition. That's what I have. So if you take your hands like this and you kind of go like that and slowly bring in almost like a binocular, do that and slowly make it smaller and smaller. And with this disease, it eventually leads to total blindness, which is what I am today. And I have been now for many, many years. It was devastating to get this news. And honestly, at eight years old, I didn't even know what it meant. All I, know, all I knew at that time is it wasn't good. And it was very difficult for my parents, for my siblings, for my friends, for all of us. You know, growing up with an eye disease is challenging <coughs> emotionally, it's challenging physically, and it's also challenging spiritually. I can literally remember crying myself to sleep as a teenager, saying, Lord, why me? It was real anger at God. Why me? My brothers don't have this. My sister doesn't have this. My friends don't have this. Why me? Or as a kid, I can remember being in gym class and, you know, we'd be playing volleyball or something and my eyes were really deteriorating quickly. And the ball would go up in the, in the ceiling and I could see the ball in the light and then it would go to the dark spot between the two lights and I'd lose it. And the ball would literally land right next to me. And I was too afraid to tell kids about my eyes. So what do they do? They tease me. So I, I held in the secret thinking I was actually seeing less stress. And I will tell you, if you have something going on in your heart, open up to somebody. Open up to people around you. It's way more stressful to hold something painful or a secret in your heart than it is just to open up. It's relieving. I didn't do it until I was in college. I was your age, actually, when I started to open up, truly open up with everybody around me about my eyes because it got to the point where I had to. So this was a very difficult period in my life. And uh, it was actually a Sunday school teacher. Her name was Mrs. Canaris. And she said, do you know that God loves every one of you? He created you. And if you let him in, he'll work with you in his plan. And I was like, yeah, right. 
what kind of plan can there be for a blind guy? Really, what kind of plan could there be? And then I was introduced to this verse, which is a human truth. And I want uh, uh, Chris can put it up there. It's very powerful. Because, you know, every religion in the world tries to deal with suffering. Every religion tries to deal with suffering. Because we all have suffering. I know everybody here has some hardship going on right now. Maybe it's a disappointment. Maybe it's a stress or a fear. Maybe you're having some anxiety or some depression. Or you have some dysfunctional relationships. Or you have a physical disease. Or you know somebody who's got addiction. Every one of us encounter some form of suffering. And if we don't, then we should suffer with somebody else. And suffer with them. So why is suffering so important in the development of who we are? Well, this human truth says it all. For we rejoice in our suffering because suffering brings endurance. Endurance brings character, and character brings hope. And hope, St. Paul says, will never disappoint. So let's just unpack that. We rejoice in our suffering, for suffering brings endurance. When you hear the word endurance, what do you think of? When you hear the word endurance, what do you, endurance equals what? I can't see your hands, so just speak up. Endurance equals what? What is endurance? You hear endurance, you think of? Strength. strength. Endurance equals strength. Endurance equals? Determination. Determination. Perseverance. Hanging in there. Get back up when we fall. You will fall. It's okay. We all fall. But we get back up. Endurance. But we're not going to become people of endurance unless we allow suffering to do its work. What do they say when you work out? No pain, no gain. No pain, no gain. Life is very similar. So when we become people of endurance, then we can transition to become people of character. And when you hear the word character, what do you think of? Character equals what? Character equals what? When you hear character, you think of values. values, virtue. It literally becomes your makeup. It becomes who you are. Okay? Well, St. Paul is specifically talking about godly virtues of kindness and gentleness and joy and courage. But we're not going to become people of character unless we have become people of endurance. Then we transition slowly, slowly through our life to a person of hope. And hope, he says, never disappoints. So when you hear hope, what do you think of? Hope equals what? Hope equals? Possibility. Possibility. Beautiful. Hope equals possibility. What else? Optimism. Optimism. So is hope half glass full or half glass <coughs> empty? Full. Full. Half glass full. See, because even in our darkest moments, if we keep a little focus on the light, and by the way, I can just see light still. It's the only thing I can still see, which is a big deal, by the way. I'll be talking about that at the talk tomorrow night. But it is to keep a little light even when we're in our suffering, because eventually we become people of hope. Something good will come from this. I don't know what, even though it stinks and it's tough, somehow something good will come from this. So suffering brings endurance, brings character, brings hope, and hope does not disappoint. Okay? So then I grew up, and as I grew up past my teenage years, and I was beginning to enter college to where you are, my first fear was, how am I going to graduate from college? Because at that point, then, I couldn't read visually. I had to have either huge magnification to read s small stuff. But the way I got through college was through other people. At that time in Minnesota, there were 300 people that read three hours a week for people like me. I would not have graduated from college if it wasn't for volunteers, women and men, that would literally sit into these tapes, record the tapes, and they'd mail them to me a week before my syllabus, and I would listen, and that's how I got through college. What a miracle. Now technology is awesome. But I'm very grateful. Without the help of others, I wouldn't have even graduated from college. 
I then went on, as uh, Professor Stevens and, and Tom Schreier said, to have an amazing career. And I worked, and I worked, and I worked. And I will tell you, I was scared to death if I'd even get a full-time job. Who would hire a blind person? Right? I, I think Tad Piper, who gave me a shot at Piper Jaffrey as a little junior analyst, and that blossomed. I just got in there, and I worked, and I worked, and I worked. And pretty soon, I was recruited to New York, and I became, over a period of time, the top-ranked airline analyst in the world for five years. It was really exciting. And then I went on back to Piper Jaffray to be president of a big division, the investment bank, and a uh, hedge fund manager, a variety of things. Very exciting career. But I want to tell you about one part of my career, because I had all kinds of excitement. Five-star hotels, first-class travel, traveling the globe. I'd get the call on the Tuesday, say, hey, we got to go to Germany tomorrow. We'd fly to Germany. We'd do business for a day. We'd come back. It was unbelievable. I was in every press you could be in, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, CNBC, the, the, the Good Morning America, the Today Show. They'd pick me up in limos and go take me to the green room and get all the makeup on. It was an unbelievable experience. And I worked and I worked and I worked. There was one problem, and that was that slowly but surely, I ignored the entire rest of my life. Everything became about my work. And it all came to a head in a hotel room in Amsterdam, where after being in 27 cities in 29 days, which I had done over and over and over and over again for years, I went to this beautiful five-star hotel, Hotel de Europe, I'll never forget it, had this great day of business, presentations, talking to money managers about airline stocks, get to my room, it's time to go to bed. I lay my head back, and I was in one of those incredibly beautiful canopy beds, you know, with all the fluffy thing up above and, and the, you know, the down comforters and the big pillows. <sighs> I lay my head back, and I go to lay my head back, and all of a sudden, from nowhere, I start to weep and cry. And I couldn't stop crying for over two hours. I didn't even know it hit me. My whole soul and body had imploded. And everything started to come clear to me that I have nothing else in my life right now. My health is not good. I was 30 pounds heavier. My marriage was in trouble. I ignored my friends. I ignored my family. Everything came crashing down. I ignored my body signs, by the way. Listen to your bodies. When your bodies are showing you something, there's probably some work to do in your soul. Time to go open up with somebody and talk about it, okay? Our bodies and our soul are very intimately connected. And this began a reworking process in my life. And I rebuilt, okay? So I really want to encourage you two things. One is it's good to work hard. And I'll talk about that, and Cindy's going to talk about it in a second as well. But two, when you have suffering and it hits you, it will hit you, open up with other people, ask God for help, let suffering begin to do its work on you. It may actually transform you to be your true self. Because we can't control our suffering sometimes, most of the time. But we can control how we react to it, even when it's really tough. So now I want to introduce you to this framework. And if you would put that up there, uh, okay. So I, I happen to be 100% Greek, okay? So we're going to use a Parthenon as the example here today, okay? <laughs> okay. So what we're going to do is look at your life and my life like building a structure. In this case, it's a temple. Do you not know you are the temple of the Holy Spirit? And it turns out there are all kinds of Old Testament, New Testament scriptures, and all kinds of literature that use building a building like your life. Even in companies today, you'll see many, many companies talking about, well, the foundation of our business is this, or the pillars of our strategy are that, right? We're going to look at it like your life and my life. So if you're going to go build, I don't know, let's just say a home, what's the first thing you have to do when you build a home? What's the very, what's that? Foundation. 
okay? The foundation sets the tone. So if you're going to build a house in Florida, you've got to build a house to be able to protect against what? Hurricane. Hurricane. How about California? You've got to build that foundation to protect? <laughs> Earthquakes. How about Minnesota? What's that? Blizzards. Could be blizzards. Go a little further. It's the cold. You've got to get down deep enough to go below the frost line or the frost line will shift and destroy your foundation, okay? And so life is the same way. And I want to really encourage you to be purposeful, intentional, decide what foundation you're going to build on. For Cindy and I, we have made the decision we want to build on our relationship with God, our relationship in Christ. That is our foundation that we're trying to build on, okay? Because the foundation will inform your whole structure. So if you look at the top of this, you'll see the top layer is the acquisition of the virtues to become a person of compassion, kindness, courage, wisdom, okay? And all those pillars get cemented to your foundation. So your foundation informs all those parts of your life. So for example, if we choose to make money our foundation, then money is going to inform every one of the decisions of all of those pillars of life. And you see them all there work, your marriages, your friendships, everything else. So you need to decide that for yourself. What foundation do you want to build your life on? Because you know what? You're going to build your life on something, You, everybody. You're going to build your life on something. Choose it. Be purposeful about it. Okay? And then I will tell you these pillars make your life complete. Now these pillars look perfectly balanced. That's not reality. Right? Life is a constant rebalancing. In my case, I did this. If you go to the next slide, I put all, for the first, I'd say, two decades of my life, of my career life, I made everything about my work. And it made me very unbalanced. Or even worse, go to the next one, I actually pulled out the work pillar and said, no, I'm going to lay work down, and that's going to be my foundation. Everything has to fit into my work. And, of course, you can see it was not something that stood. It did not stand the test of time. Okay. So be very careful whatever you're going to make your foundation because it's what you're going to build your life on. And the reason to build a beautiful life is to bear lots of fruit to people. And so if you go to the next one, we need to have a strong home because storms of life are going to come. Storms of life are going to come. And they're out of our control, just like nature. Storms come. And they're out of your control. Same thing here. Maybe dysfunctional relations, like I say, it could be physical disease, loss of a job, company downsizes. It happens. Or friendship dysfunction. Or we have addictions or have family members that have addictions. These things happen. Or mental illness. Okay? These things happen. So if we are building a strong overall, overall structure, we're more prepared to handle these things. And if we don't, we can always rebuild. Rebuilding stuff, though, I will say. But it can be rebuilt. And that's what I had to do. I had to kind of reconstruct the home. Okay? So, consider letting your suffering do some work on your heart, your soul, and your body. Be purposeful of your foundation. Okay? And now Cindy is going to take two pillars, and she's going to get deep into them. Okay? So, thank you very much. Welcome, Cindy. All right. Thank you. Great to be here. Okay, well, so if we think about Paul's slide about the storms of life, we see that there are a lot of things that are out of our control, right? Even you think about that sweet veteran, war was not in his control. But the good news is that there are a lot of things in our control. And taking the time and energy to figure out how we can control the elements of our life is a worthy task. So I'm going to go back to the fact that... Um, while if Paul were German or Norwegian, the house that he presented probably wouldn't look like the Parthenon, right? Anybody see My Big Fat Greek Wedding? That movie where any of our Dolis' family lived in a home with these big pillars that look like the Parthenon? We're going to go with that because that example actually does teach us something. So we're going to give credit to Paul's brutness on this. So I would like to ask you a question. How many of you, or someone, tell me how you think they built those pillars back in the ancient Greek and Roman times. And remember, 
no manufacturing plant for pillars, and uh, you know there weren't any big cranes that would yank the pillar up. How is it that they did that? Anybody know? You can take a guess, Dick. Yeah. So a lot of people working together. Right. Especially to help lift them up. Okay. Well, how do you think they actually? Because you're absolutely right. It took a lot of people. Um, Okay, so can you say that again? Um, you would, they would start on like a hill, they would build up a hill. Build up a hill. Slowly dig down, so that as opposed to trying to push up the pillar, it would right. start to stand up. Well, that's probably true if the pillar existed, but the pillar didn't exist. And the way they actually built it, this is kind of fascinating, is they took a piece of marble. They cut a piece of marble. And they may have used it to dig into the ground, like you said, but they put that piece of marble down and they kept stacking another piece of marble on top of each other. And they created these marble structures that were perfectly in line with the other one. So over time, they had layer by layer by layer by layer of marble. And it was so perfectly done that if you walked up to it, you may not even see the line. But it made it really strong, and there was really no other way to do it. So you're wondering, why am I belaboring this point about pillars? Well, it turns out that we have the exact opportunity to build our life pillars the way they did that in ancient times. Layer by layer by layer of things that we can control. And this is really important because when we start our jobs and pieces of life, Things are happening all around us, and the more intentional we can be, the better we are. So here's what I'd like you to do. Everybody grab a piece of paper, and what I'd like you to do is draw a line down the center of the paper, and on one side, write the word work, and the other side, write the word finance. happen to be the two pillars that we've selected to talk about because, quite frankly, when you leave Notre Dame, those are going to be pillars that are going to be probably first and foremost of importance. And when you think about um, the idea of work, this, this um, diagram shows us how much of our life we spend working. That's nine hours of a day. Now, I know some of you, how many of you have this finance test? Okay, well, I know you slept less than eight hours last night, but in a real life, you get some sleep, and then you do everything else, and then you have nine hours or more, in most cases, of work. So it's worthwhile to think about what we would do to build a successful work pillar. Now, I'm going to give you a few parameters about what goes into uh, a successful pillar. And before you start writing, they're the behaviors the mindsets, the actions, they're not the end result, like a promotion. You know, they are the things that you would do, the virtues, the activities. Um, those are the kinds of things that you can do to build that pillar. So take a minute or two to write down the things you would put in your work pillar and your finance pillar, and then we're going to share. Okay, Professor Stevens, would you mind yeah, jotting some it. things on the board? Vanna. All right, Vanna. Yeah, repeat what people say. Something. What's that? Repeat what people say. Good one. Okay. All right, who wants to start? Who's got an idea of what you would put in your control to work on this work pillar? Right. Oh, yeah. Honesty. Honesty. Oh, my gosh, is that important? And also important, as you look at a, a, a firm or a company or something, to find somebody who values that as well. Honesty, beautiful. Yes? Organization. <coughs> Organization? Yeah. Being organized. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Are you an organized person? No, I really not Yeah, so, <laughs> no, like me. We need to have organization or else we have a very weak work pillar. All right, who else? Yes? Good attitude. A good attitude. Why is that important? Because that's how you start off your day. 
Building relationships, absolutely. Everybody's worked with a curmudgeon. <laughs> it's no fun. You don't want to be that one, right? Okay, what's another? Continuing education. Continue education. Well, and you guys started in a pretty good place. Bravo, by the way, to all of you. I know it's not an easy task to get here, but continue education, valuing your education. Absolutely. Yes? Passion. Passion. Why is that important? You gotta love what you do and have you know, interest in it. Absolutely. Having passion and excitement. And you know what? That's one of those things that may take a while to really identify what it is you love to do. Right? I would actually add on that kind of a side note of making sure that the jobs you have, the skills you have, match the job, right? Because that passion doesn't work unless those skills match that job. I was a salesperson and I loved to persuade, to, to look at the big picture, to identify my strategy and how I was going to get there to get a win win with a client or whatever the case is. I mean, it was like chocolate for me. It was fabulous. But when I left work and decided I would do some work outside of the house while I was being a mom, I took on a little task at what I thought was a little task at our school carnival. All right? So yeah, whatever you want me to do, I'd be happy to do it. So they, they asked me to be the one that was in charge to get the prizes for all the games. You know, those little plastic prizes, I didn't even value those. But anyway, that was my job. So I'd order the prizes, figure out what we needed to get in each room and, you know, whatever. It turns out that it was a disaster for me. I am not a person who likes details at all. The person who did it with me was fabulous. She could have been an accountant. She was really good at the details, but I hated it. And I never really understood why I hated that job so much. In fact, it took another two years before I even recognized, oh my goodness, that's why I didn't like that job. I'm not a detail-oriented person. So when you think about the skills to create that passion, is that you have to recognize that sometimes it takes a while to even figure out what are those skills that you do well. So that might be toward the top of your pillar, but it's an important one. Yes? Ambition. Ambition. Why is that important? Because you have to know what you want and then be willing to put in the work to get it. Okay, so would that be like goal orientation? Yeah. Yeah, it's a, yeah. And energy to get there? Absolutely. Those are good ones. Let me see what else I have here on mine. Team player. That's an important thing. You're going to see a lot of gossip and um, people speaking poorly about one another. You don't want to do that. You want to be a team player. Here's one that you would never even think to put on a pillar. Um, take directions from your boss. All right, so that seems silly, doesn't it? But it's important that you give your boss what he or she is looking for. And I've got a funny story that Paul would tell about an intern who ended up being, um, they didn't have enough for him to do. So they said to Paul, can you keep this guy busy? So he gave him a project that he really needed help on. And it turns out that the guy put a lot of energy into it and came up with some wonderful things, but it had nothing to do with what Paul asked. Nothing. So when Paul said, well, what's the deal? He said, well, gee, Mr. Karras, I just thought this was more important, and I thought this was a more creative way of going about it. Well, that didn't, his work pillar at that point crumbled a little. He didn't do what he needed to do, and it's important for us to keep that in mind, silly as it may sound. What could that guy have done? What could that guy have done? Yeah? I don't know, talk to his boss about possibly doing that? Absolutely! Have a communication. The guy sat right across from, you know, in a cubicle, never once asked Paul, but talk to him, or maybe even do the project the way Paul wanted, and then provide an alternative. He would have been a star, right? So, anyway. That's a pretty good list. You guys came up with a bunch. There's lots more. Ask questions, have humility, positive attitude we have. Those are some really good ones. Having real relationships could go on and on in any career. That's an important one. So let's take a minute now and take a peek at the finance pillar. See what you wrote down. Now these two pillars are completely tied. And here's an interesting fact that you may not have thought about. But whatever job you take, whether it's a, a job that doesn't pay very well or a job that pays a ton, the same work in building your finance pillar, it's the same thing. 
It's the same thing, whether you're in a nonprofit or if you're making a ton of money. And when you think of a finance pillar, we think money, right? It's those things that you do to either manage, create, build. So what are some of the, oh, wait, actually, before I ask you, I'm going to give you one. It's a gimme. And this one is, uh, there's a funny story that goes with this. Um, Paul was asked to speak to an MBA group. They were graduating. And uh, somebody asked the question, what advice would you give us? And his advice actually made some people laugh in the room. They didn't think it was serious. They were waiting for this real visionary piece of advice, and they're starting their career. And what it was, and I want you guys to write it down, because I, we both think it's the basis for any finance pillar. And that is spend less than you earn. This is kind of funny. Spend less than you earn. You think you learned that in third grade, right? But this is the basis for your financial pillar. And again, we wouldn't really even understand this, but we've worked and had people work for us who made a tremendous amount of money. And because they didn't spend less than they earned, they lost it all. Bankruptcy sometimes, losing homes, having to walk away from homes, because it becomes really easy in our world to get excited about material things, right? I, I, would, I was just ordering some Converse shoes for our senior son, and I, I mean, there are a million kinds of Converse. You could have a different pair for every outfit. They even have cartoon ones now, which I thought was kind of funny. Anyway, so that's a, that's a real basic one. So let's hear what you guys have in your finance pillars. What pieces would you be doing to develop a strong <coughs> financial pillar? Know how much you're spending. Know how much you're spending. So is that like a budget, maybe? Yeah, really get on that budget. And then when you know how much and you plan for it, make sure you do what you want to do, right? We have a senior in college son who just took a job at Baird, got a really wonderful signing bonus and a really great salary. And I think he thinks he could probably buy anything. But in the end, when he starts writing down all those boring things that he's going to have to pay for, like insurance and a new car or a, a car, I would say, I mean, that money is going to go quickly. So having that budget is important. Yes? Uh, planning ahead, like having a uh, save up for retirement or rainy day fund. Absolutely. Planning ahead. Would you, would you also say savings? Would that be another piece of that? Mm -hmm. So planning and savings. Savings is super important. You know that it would take... 44 years, if you wanted to earn, a, if you wanted to retire with a million dollars, it would take 44 years, $500 a month to get to a million dollars. That's, you have to be really thoughtful and intentional about that, right? That's a really important thing. And we have no idea sometimes what we're saving for. So it's, it's important to start. Who else? Yes. Smart investment. Smart investments, great. You just want to take that money and put it in your pocket, right? So what would you do? How do you, how do you figure out what a smart investment is? Um, I don't know, maybe doing research or like trusting people who like do that for a living. Right, like a financial planner? It's a great point. So trusting people who know. I started, I used a financial planner when I was 25. Someone suggested it or I never would have come up with the idea. But I didn't even know what I was saving for. You know, I'd already uh, purchased a townhouse and I had a company car. Like, what else did I need, right? But in those 10 years from 25 to 35, before I married Paul, I ended up with a really nice savings amount that I wouldn't have had if I hadn't trusted a professional. So it could be a, a financial planner, it could be your parents, it could be anyone that you respect in that area. Yes? Uh, limit buying. Oh my gosh, that's a huge one. Limit buying. That is so important. There are actually five areas that you can, well, there's lots of areas, but the five that really make a big difference are your housing, your car, eating out, hard to believe, huh? Eating out, travel, and clothing. The decisions you make on those categories will make a huge difference. So that new job, don't go buy a brand new car. Some financial player, planner said, take 10% of what your salary is and use that to buy a car. 
that was a financial planner's advice. But whatever those things are, making sure that you keep that balance is great. Let me see if I have anything else that you don't all have. Um, really, some good, good things. Okay, I'm going to end with that one. Um, this is one that I'm sure many of you wouldn't have thought about. For those of you who think you might be getting married, this is critical. Find a spouse who, who has similar ideas about finances. Not just about how much to make, but how much to spend, how much to give, how much to save. 50% of marriages today say finance is their number one stressor. And I'll tell you a quick story about the guy I dated right before Paul. Great guy, successful salesperson. We both traveled for our life, right? So we decided to go to um, uh, New York City to see the Rockettes at Christmas time. And as we were walking toward where we were going to eat, there were people who were asking for donations on the side. So I, of course, did that. And he, he grabbed me and said, Cindy, you know, don't do that. Because they're going to just spend it on, on alcohol and, and drugs. And, you know, he might have a point there. So I didn't give any more as we walked along. Then we went for dinner, and we went to one of these deli places that have those huge sandwiches. I don't know if some of you may have done that. Anyway, I ate about a quarter of the sandwich, and in the end, I, I thought, perfect. I'll, I'll wrap up the sandwiches, and I'll give them to those people who were on the side of the street. So while he was in the restroom, I had the way to wrap them up. So as we're heading out, he's like, what, what are you doing with the sandwiches? And I said, well, I'm going to give them to the people who are, are needing help out on the street. <gasps> don't do that. I mean, they may follow us. Now this guy, he, he was well built, he didn't have to worry about anybody following us, but for the second time in a day, I didn't do what was natural to me. That did not feel well. Now imagine had I married that person, that would have been a source of issue for us our whole life. By that point in my career, I had spent 10 years earning and tithing money. And at this point, it, it's, it's really important to think that through with a spouse. So uh, I'm going to show you another slide that sort of makes this point. If you see this plot here, on the bottom is monthly family spending. All right? And on the y-axis is the pressure to make more money. Now, if you do the things in this work pillar, you don't have to worry about promotions and making more money because those things, are, you're naturally going to have that happen. But if your spending ends up being artificially high, it puts tremendous pressure on it and that organic promotion or increase becomes forced. And that really creates stress in a family. So you have the ability to monitor that on the bottom. So keep that in mind. Okay, I think I've got most of these. So we just picked these two pillars because we felt like they were universal to a finance student. What you did today, you should do for all of the pillars in Paul's diagram. And particularly when you get married, to sit down with your wife and understand how parenting is going to work, your marriage is going to work, all of those things are critical. So if hopefully today we've given you a few things, and three that we'd like you to walk away from is knowing as you build those pillars, the things that you can do are important. Be intentional. It's a very important thing. Don't worry about the promotions and the increases and whatever. It seems like that consumes us. Work on the things that you can control and, and take control of those things. The second thing is make sure that you identify what your foundation is going to be and stay with that. It gets harder and harder in life. And having that there is a really critical piece. And the last is that we all have some sort of suffering. You know, whether it's Paul, like Paul's blindness or if it is whatever your suffering is. But embrace it. Recognize that it can be a very powerful movement in your life. Uh, and allow that to be something that, that helps you grow. All right, I'm going to have Paul come up. We're going to have you ask any questions you might have on anything we talked about today, whether it's about Paul's eyes or career or faith, whatever it is you'd like to ask. All right, so any questions of any kind? All questions are good questions. Questions? Yes. Um, was your disease genetic? Like, um, or like, Yes. So what
where did the disease come from? It, it is a genetic disease, which means my mom and dad both carried the gene. It was recessive, so each of the kids had a 25% chance. They did not know they carried the genes. And we went back to Greece, the little villages I'm from, and we really couldn't find too much because at that time in the 60s and 70s, they didn't have electricity in the villages of Greece. So, you know, even night blindness was kind of like, well, you know, it, so we didn't find anybody, but it was genetic for sure. Other questions? Yes. What do you think is the inner driver in your darkest moment? What is your inner driver in your darkest moment? Wow, what is my inner driver in my darkest moments? I would, I would have to say it's definitely my faith. It's crying out to God, you know, to be real and raw with the Lord to say, Lord, I am really hurting. Much like David is in the Psalms. If you read the Psalms, you know, David's constantly just being raw with his emotions. And for me, that's really where I've gotten my strength. And then to open up to my loved ones. Because, you know, we need each other. We're meant to be with each other. So to tell Cindy, or I have a really good uh, friend, Wes Tang, he's a Chinese guy from my childhood uh, in college, and I have a couple other childhood friends, Rick and Jeff, people that I can really open up to. Uh, so it's a combination of those two things. <clears throat> and it's okay, we're gonna have dark moments. The key when it's dark is keep a little light. Just don't ever let go of the light when you get dark. It's okay if you get dark for a while. Just don't let go of the light, okay? Other questions, great questions. Yes, what made you get into the airline industry? What made me get into the airline industry, I'll tell you, I'm very grateful, it happened uh, just because the industry was assigned to me. I was a junior analyst, and when it became time for a senior analyst, they said, Paul, we want you to take uh, this industry, because I had worked as a junior under this airline person who moved on to do something else. And for me, it was a real blessing, because as, a, as an analyst, you've got to really know the, the, the companies, the strategies, the operations. Well, if I was a consumer analyst, a lot of consumer analysts have to be able to see, be able to check out a retailer, or visualize the brand, or see how the visual appeal is going to be for the customer. In airlines, it's very numerically driven. It's numbers, it's available seat miles, and load factors, return on capital. It's about operational excellence. So it's very much analytical. And that was something I could do without, without having great eyesight. Great question. Other questions? Yes. How did you two meet? Uh, would you believe it was a blind date with a blind guy? <laughs> we That's were, true. It was a great blind date. I, I, we were both a little older in life, and uh, the interesting thing is I had a girlfriend who uh, said, you've got to meet this guy. And so I met him, and it was pretty pretty instant. We yeah. both felt pretty strongly. We stayed up till 2 in the morning talking that night, and uh, both of us were like, wow. And we really connected. One of the things that was important to me was to find somebody who was strong. And somebody who, when I fell apart, because oftentimes I have to be strong, would be strong in our relationship. And I, I picked a winner. She's got big shoulders, guys. Everybody relies on my wife, Cindy, including me. Yeah. Other questions? Great question. Here's another one. Uh, you mentioned that in college or the... Uh, help with the eyesight in your work that there were volunteers who helped you. However, once you entered into your career, how did you overcome the box? So how did I, so in, in college I had volunteers that read for me. How did I overcome when I got into the workforce? And in the workforce, it was right as my eyes continued to deteriorate and get worse and worse. At the beginning of my career, I used huge magnification. And so I would have to have these big magnifying glasses on and then this big screen that would magnify stuff. And the computer, even in the early days, and the computers, uh, in the mid to late 80s, they started to have magnification capability and had everything going for me. And, but as that even got worse, the voice technology in the 90s took off. And I was so grateful because then now, even since the 90s, I've been able to do spreadsheets, Word documents, PDFs, all in my ear. No mouse, all keystrokes. And it's really, it's really a miracle. So technology took off, but I will say the companies I worked for, the, my workmates were unbelievable. As I opened up about my eyes, more and more, everybody helped me. My clients even helped me. You know, I used to go to my first dinners in New York. I'd go to these fancy five-star restaurants, and I'd get there early, get seated, and then they'd, people would come, and the waiter would say, okay, what's everybody going to order? And I'd say, what's your special tonight? And the guy, because I couldn't read the menu. And the, and the guy would say, oh, you know, I don't know, Reverend Frost features, I don't know, whatever it was. And I'd say, 
Great, I'll have that. That's one because I couldn't read the menu. Okay? Well, eventually I said, what am I doing? I was causing more stress in my body, my soul. So I just started telling clients, and then they had to read the menu. And it was beautiful. People, I tell you, you know, as much, when you get into business or whatever you go into, it's still about people. Be yourself. <clears throat> Build real relationships. Don't worry about the success. Cindy made that point. You do the layers of the pillar, your work ethic, your excellence, and these things, you don't have to worry about where it's going to lead. Don't worry. It will happen on its own. If you are building those behaviors, those attitudes, your career will do whatever it's meant to do, and it will be far beyond what you believe. But if you, you try to jump too quick and try to say, i got to get successful today, and you lose your patience, and you lose those blocking and tackling, your work pillars will be very weak. Don't be patient, let it build, and you will be incredibly, incredibly successful for whatever that means. Whatever that means. Okay, is that it? Yep. All right, Paul. Please.